thank you very much for inviting me to, um, to give the lecture tonight and it's great to be working with the Equality, Equality Centre here in UCD. We've only been going about five years in the LSE's International Inequality Institute so you obviously have got a lot more experience than we have and I hope this is the first of uh, a number of conversations and collaborations. Uh, what I want, want to try and do today, uh, as Marie was saying, is to kind of reflect upon my long-standing interest in social class. Um, uh, most of those studies in social class have, been, have mainly used the UK as, a, as my frame. And so I sort of feel familiar with understanding what's going on inside the UK. But then over the last four years, I've been director of the International Inequality Institute and I've had to think about, well, what does it mean internationally? And how do we understand the global dynamics of inequality? And so my lecture today is trying to bring together these two sets of interests, my long-standing concerns with class and how the uh, changing character and nature of global inequality needs us to think in different ways about class. So although I've written a lot about class, I actually want to, in some respects, reposition the, my thinking in terms of needing to place the <coughs> global dynamics of inequality centre stage and class in a somewhat not subsidiary, but in a kind of more reciprocal relationship. Now, um, the starting point, really, uh, is th these books like these, some of which you'll be familiar with, um, which over the last five years have really put the issue of inequality on the agenda of social science, of politics, of you know, major interests around the world. Um, I still remember that the, the book by Thomas Piketty, Cap of the 21st Century, which came out in 2014. If any of you have read it, it's a large, heavyweight, hardback, lots and lots of figures and graphs and uh, data. And it sold you know, nearly, nearly 2 million copies, which is quite incredible for a book of that size and, uh, and length. Um, but it's not just that book. Another famous book by Anthony Atkinson, the kind of doyen of the economics of inequality, also a bestseller. Um, the book by epidemiologists uh, Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett called The Spirit Level had a massive impact too in emphasising how inequality was a major social issue which caused all sorts of social bads. And more recently, uh, a book by another economist, Branko Milanovic, on global inequality. So there's been this astonishing outpouring of thinking about inequality and the challenge of inequality. And as a sociologist who's written about class, I've been trying to think about how, how do we need to reposition our debates about class to take account of this new kind of work. And I'm also you know, really aware that as sociologists, we've written a lot, a lot about uh, class, gender, race, the categorical divisions, if you like, the inequalities between groups. And we haven't written so much about inequality in income and wealth terms. We tend to leave that to economists, and I think we can't do that. I think we've actually got to have some interface between the work which the economists have led and the work around social groups, social categories, uh, and to see how these things are intersecting. <coughs> so that's the aim today. Um, and I want to kind of begin um, with some uh, challenges, um, which I think the new economics of inequality poses to sociology. So although I'm a sociologist, I'm kind of uh, taking a rather a view from economics almost. Um, so the, chal the challenges, I, was, I would say, are, are fourfold. Uh, firstly, you know, when sociologists have talked about class, they've often done so by defining class in terms of occupations. Manual, non-manual, you know, proletarian, bourgeoisie. So class is about employment. It's about your position in the division of labour. Or... If you come at it from the perspective of a kind of Pierre Bourdieu, cultural perspective, which would be very influential for me, you look at it in terms of consumption, lifestyle, your practices. Now, these are very, very powerful ways of thinking about class, but they don't speak directly to inequalities of income and wealth, which I think we need to place uh, at the centre of our attention. So I want to talk a bit about how, how we might do that within the tradition of class analysis. And secondly, um, you know, I've, I've written about class for you know, 30 years, a long time. The key debate has always been about the relationship between working class and middle class. Who is working class? Where, what is the proletariat? Uh, 
Are the middle classes a conservative, you know, bullock, or are they a progressive force? And we got very obsessed with the dividing line between middle and working class in sociological analysis. Well, you know, I now think those debates, you know, even though I spent many years addressing them, have taken attention away from the top end, what's happening at the top, the elites. Um, and that's kind of what I want to talk about, how we, might, how we can try and bring debates about class into relationship to the debates about top end effects, elite effects, if you like. Thirdly, um, and this is something which Michael Mann has written a lot about, when we think about social class, we often assume classes to be defined by national boundaries. So we talk about class relationships within, you know, UK, uh, Norway, Ireland, whatever. And we kind of assume class structures stop at national borders. Um, now, that's very problematic for all the reasons we know about migration, flows between locations. Um, and we need to think about classes beyond those national boundaries. And here, the challenge of global inequality studies is really, really important. Um, and, and finally, um, this is a point which I'm really uh, trying to explore theoretically. Um, one of the things which, which Piketty puts on the agenda in his, in his book on capital in the 21st century is the need to place wealth accumulation at the centre of our understanding of inequality. What that means is to look at the way inequality is driven by the process of accumulation. So here there's a debate with Karl Marx, of course, in the Marxist tradition. And it's making us realise that social inequality is a long-term process. We have to place it in a long durée of change and not see it as a kind of cross-sectional uh, issue, which tends to be in the way in which it has been analysed by sociologists. So these are four big challenges. Apologies for being a bit abstract. I'm going to try and make them a bit more concrete and, um, and flesh them out as I go on to my slides. But I think I hope you realise, I hope you recognise that these are really big challenges to how we understand social class in the context of global inequality. So let me begin by saying a few words about sociological models of class and how they interface with economic analyses of inequality. Um, so I'll just skate over some things. This may be familiar to some of you, but it may not be. So I'll, I'll, I will try and uh, lay a platform out. And uh, the, the kind of the key point is if you come from a, a perspective from sociology, and whether that's a Marxist perspective or a Weberian perspective, nonetheless, the key debate has been what is the role of the working class as a kind of force for social change? It, how, how and in what ways is the proletariat a force bringing about either revolutionary change or reformist change or some kind of progressive political project? And the sociology of class has come out of that debate. And one of the implications of that has been to see social classes as groups, groups with very clear boundaries, where or clear class thresholds where you can put people into one class or another class. And the way that's normally been done is by placing people into classes according to your occupation and your employment. Um, and so there's been this kind of uh, focusing of measurements of class around your job and your employment. Uh, and the most famous way in which this is done in sociology is by the by the uh, Oxford sociologist John Goldthorpe. It has become the dominant international model for measuring social class. And versions of this approach have been used across the world. It's a very, very skillful, very effective way of trying to categorise people according to your class position linked to your employment and your occupation. And without going into detail, um, you, can, you can get a sense there by looking at the, uh, the denomination it's called, the various job titles, that you can divide people into either seven classes or three classes, depending on how much detail you want. Um, and basically, this is a version of the old divide between middle and working class. So classes one and two are the old white collar workers, professional, managerial class, if you like. Class six and seven are the, the proletariat, the manual workers. And then you have a group in the middle who are some kind of intermediate class between those three, between those two. Um, without going into the, th the theorisation of this, uh, this 
exhibits, I think, in a very clear form how we have understood classes according to your job. Now, lots of problems about this, in my view, and much of my writing has been engaged in a debate about this way of thinking about class. One of them is many people don't have jobs. You know, only you know, half the population have jobs. How do we handle people who do not have a position in the labour market? Secondly, there's a very broad brush categories. Um, and can we really, for instance, take one of these classes, say class one, professionals, administrators and managers, and see people in that class as sharing a certain common fate? And although this model has been very effectively used, particularly with quantitative work, in my view, it doesn't address the uh, changing nature of inequality. What are the challenges which I think are posed to this way of conceptualising class today? Um, this is a list which could be expanded, it could be developed, but very quickly, and I'll, I'll, I will come back to some of these points in a minute. You know, as I said earlier, the debate on class came out of a debate about the working class, and the working class as a progressive political force. We have to accept the fact that in most nations, the manual working class, the industrial working class, is now a small minority of the workforce. Demographically, it is not a dominant part of the labour market. In many parts of the world, and not all parts of the world, the trade union movement have also become substantially weaker. Um, politically, the labour movement, uh, which you know, in some kind of forms could be seen, albeit very imperfectly, as some representing working class interests, has that project of, of the, of the labour movement has changed quite radically. And we see this very, very clearly, I think, in the UK, where for the first time ever in the last election, um, the working class, the sort of manual working class, the routine working class are more likely to, to vote Conservative than Labour. And, so that pro and, the, and the Labour Party, by contrast, has become a party of well-educated, younger people. So this is, this is still a kind of class divide, but it's not the classic class divide. And that kind of shift has been found in many nations uh, and it challenges the way we think about class and politics. Second issue, um, as I'll talk about in a minute, uh, you cannot use these big classes, occupation classes, to understand the dynamics of income inequality because it doesn't give us enough of a, uh, have a handle on what is happening at the top end. And I'll talk about this in a minute. Thirdly, um, Going back to my, my growing interest in we've got to understand elites. Like it or not, what people with resources, wealth, power are doing matters a lot for social change. They are the drivers of many of the key things happening in the world. Um, and we need to understand that world of elite power uh, if we're going to, I think, use social class as a means of understanding social and historical change. And fourthly, as I'll say a bit more about in a minute, towards the end of my lecture, um, that model of you know, using versions of this kind of class schema and saying that's how it stacks up in the UK, this, this is how it might vary in, say, Scandinavia or France, that is too simplistically deploying a method methodologically nationalist approach to, to class. So, um, I'm going to move on to that. So, let me move on to the first. Um, my, the first point I want to talk about, which is the importance of top-end effects. Um, if we are trained in a kind of particular view of social science, we believe in the importance of the, of the normal distribution, in which you're interested in the, me in the median and the middle, and then there's a curve uh, away from that middle. And much of our thinking about social class is based upon that normal distribution approach to, to, the, to the world. But what we have increasingly got to recognise is the fact that it's top end, if you like, it's the few percentage points at the top end of any distribution who really vary and really differ in key ways from the average people. And here's a graph which just illustrates this point very well from a Danish sociologist, Christoph Ellersgaard. It doesn't really matter what it's about, but what it tries to tell you is uh, the proportion of sons in Canada and Denmark who are in the same kind of job as their fathers. And those people, those sons, are uh, uh, arranged at the bottom on the x-axis according to their position in the income distribution in those two countries. And the point I want to emphasise here is that there's not much variation for most 
Danish or Canadian sons. We can see that Canadian sons, for some reason, are more likely to be working in the same sector as their father, but there's not much variation until you get right to the top. And if you look at the, the top 2 or 3%, you suddenly see a proportion of sons working in the same area of employment as their fathers increasing radically to, you know, doubling. Now, you'd miss that if you had large categorical groups. It's only by having the detailed, focused analyses if you break down the population in very minute ways that you can begin to see those kinds of uh, top-end effects. And I want to give you a couple of examples of this from the Great British Class Survey, which Marie mentioned at the beginning, <coughs> which is this very large web survey. Uh, because it was such a large survey, a third of a million people did it, we can go into great detail. And this is a graph which looks at people's household income along the bottom, along the uh, x-axis. Um, and so you, as you can see on the right-hand side, people earning, uh, people right on the, on the right-hand side of this are incredibly well paid. They're in the top 0.3% of the income distribution, a quarter of a million pounds after tax. So we're, we're talking about the super rich here. People on the left-hand side are living in poverty. And this tells you, you know, what, how, many, how many of those people in those different income bands knew an aristocrat, a factory worker, a shop assistant, and a chief executive. And as you can see, it's kind of predictable that you know, the poor people tend to know a shop assistant and a factory worker. As you move towards people with more wealth, more income, people are more likely to know the chief executive and the aristocrat. But the really important point is just these top end, though the, prop the proportion of people knowing aristocrats just goes up very quickly. So it appears that nearly half of people earning a quarter of a million pounds or so know an aristocrat, which is more than twice as many as people earning 150,000 pounds. So this is, this is a variation among the super rich, but it's a very important one. It's a very striking one. So again, we get the sense that we need to know the top end effects if we to grasp these dynamics. And I want to briefly mention the work of uh, my colleagues, um, uh, Sam Friedman and Daniel Lorison who've also done um, some work on social mobility into elite occupations. And uh, the point to make here is all these jobs, uh, they're all highly educated, highly, you know, um, you know, highly professional posts. They're all in this, this, um, this social class one. Okay? So if you, if you use the class category, all of these jobs would be in the top class, professionals, administrators and managers. Um, but the point is, there's actually very big differences in terms of the proportion of people in those jobs who come from other privileged backgrounds and how many of them have been socially mobile into those backgrounds. And what you can see in the red box, the top, is if you're a doctor or a lawyer, your chance of being upwardly mobile into those jobs is pretty limited. Only 4% of doctors come from working class backgrounds. 13% of lawyers. Um, by contrast, if you go down to some of the other jobs, for instance, the ones at the bottom, engineers, public sector managers, people working in IT or the protective civil service, much higher rates of upper mobility. So what this is pointing to is really quite uh, micro distinctions within top class, which we need to understand. And it's interesting that doctors and lawyers are so exclusive because well, these are old old professions, they're not new, they're very credentialised, highly meritocratic professions, and yet they are also really at the heart, the heart of the reproduction of elite groups. We would miss that if we just had these big class categories. My final bit of uh, data from the Great British Class Survey looks at the income levels of graduates from different UK universities. One of the great things about the Great British Class Survey is because it was such a big survey, we could look at the effects of going to a particular university in the UK. Rather than just comparing university graduates with non-graduates or whatever, we could actually say, well, what difference does it make to go to the University of Oxford to look at your income? And this takes all the Russell Group universities. Okay, so these are all the top research universities. We're leaving out the new universities here. Um, and it looks at the household income of graduates from those universities. 
And even though these are all Russell Group universities, there is a substantial difference. Queen's University Belfast is at the bottom, um, Oxford at the top. Uh, but the point again I want to make is that, that, that there is a kind of line, but the line sharpens the higher up you go. So o the Oxford and the LSE are quite substantially different even from King's College London, Imperial College and Cambridge. And so again we're seeing this kind of top level effects which you can only grasp if you really have the kind of micro data uh, to allow us to, to understand what's going on here. And they testify to the need to, uh, to recognise elites, the very privileged, are really different from people below them. If we worried about the middle, where, what the average was, you'd miss out that top end effect. Okay. So that's one ingredient of what I wanted to talk about. Um, second, or sorry, well, this is my third uh, topic, is the fate of what I call Bourdieuian class models. So I was very influenced by thinking about social class through the lens of Pierre Bourdieu. Now, um, some of you will be interested in Bourdieu, some of you won't. Um, I'm not going to explain this diagram to you. Um, it's the diagram you love or hate, or don't understand, but I'll try to explain the logic of it. Because it Bourdieu produced this graph in his very famous book, Distinction, which was a map of what he called French social space in the 1970s. And basically what he tried to do is he carried out a survey of French lifestyles and consumption practices, and he then used a version of cluster analysis to kind of classify the main dis distinctions, the main differences in the lifestyles. Now, the, what, he, what he is arguing here is if you, if you scan the difference between top and bottom, the y-axis, if you like, between the people at the top of this and the bottom, the big difference is how much capital do you have, how much wealth and income do you have. So people at the top are very wealthy, and they play the piano, um, they go to concerts, they play golf, they like drinking cocktails, the people at the bottom like Tchaikovsky and, uh, and uh, auto real magazines. And this, is a, this is what he calls a volume of capital axis. The haves and the have-nots, if you like. But he also says, this is a crucial point, there's more to it than that. You can't just define people according to their capital. You've also got to look at the secondary opposition between left and right. And he, he argues that there's also a distinction between people with cultural capital um, people with educational assets, um, but not much money, who are on the left, who are, if you like, the artistic avant-garde, what he calls the intellectuals, and people on the right-hand side, who he calls the industrialists, who have lots of money, but aren't necessarily well-educated. So people on the left, they like the abstract cultural production of people like Andy Warhol and uh, Kandinsky and Bertolt Brecht, um, People on the right like driving big Peugeot cars. So that's the kind of the opposition he, he pulls out in uh, French space. And he said the key issue he's making is class is more than one dimension. It's not just about volume of capital, it's to do with the type of capital too. Very important contribution. He's saying class is not a linear category. It's been very influential on the way I want to think about class. But... Um, uh, this, is, sorry, this is another model which we did in the, using the Great British Class Survey. And I'm gonna, I'll try and explain these, these labels quickly to you, so don't worry about trying to decode it. But the key, the key thing today is to say that if you compare the, the labels on the right-hand side with the left-hand side, the activities in black are leisure activities. The, the labels in red are to do with music you like. If something has a two after it, it means you do it a lot. If it has a zero after it, it means you don't do it at all. Um, and the, the big opposition here is between people on the right-hand side who are very actively engaged in doing lots of stuff and people on the left-hand side who just are not doing the kind of cultural activities which are asked about in surveys. This is a kind of engagement axis, if you like. And these days, in most nations, <coughs> this has now drowned out the distinction between the intellectuals and industrialists. So the kind of separation between avant-garde's and uh, economically well-off has become much less strong than it used to be. And here, uh, Piketty, um, who, although he's an economist, is very influenced by Pierre Bourdieu's thinking, makes this very important point, that when Pierre Bourdieu 
did his map of French social space in 1970, the world, certainly the developed world, was probably the most equal it's ever been in income terms. So economic inequalities were much more muted than they were before and then the, the way they are now. So in that situation, you might expect cultural differences to be more important. If you're living in a society which is relatively equal economically, you might find the difference between intellectuals and industrialists to take on more significance. But as economic inequality increases again, as it has done over the last three or four decades, then cultural capital may be much less significant than economic capital. So uh, Piketty, in red here at the bottom, says, my message is to say, in order to think about power and inequality, we need to combine the two, but more importantly, because we have a return of capital in the sense of financial capital, real estate capital, which is playing a very big role today, much bigger than the 50s, 60s and 70s. So we have the return of economic capital as a key divide in a more intense way than Bourdieu uh, found in France in the 70s. Now, I'm sorry, this is a bit, uh, I just want to pull this point home and excuse the uh, slightly jargonistic way I've put these things, but what do we mean by capital? Okay. And this is, I think, a really, so it's a concept Marx uses, <coughs> Bourdieu uses, and I think we need to kind of return to thinking about capital <coughs> if we're to understand inequality. Why? Because capital is inequality which accumulates. Capital, by focusing on capital, you are saying that certain kinds of structural advantages accumulate and intensify. And uh, so Marx famously distinguishes between money and capital. Money, capital is money put to work to make more money. When you put money in the bank and you get an interest on it, that is capital. When you have money in your back pocket, using it as cash, it's not capital. And of course, capital accumulates, and that force of accumulation means that inequality, left to its own devices, will intensify and grow. But the nature of that accumulation varies. And I think it's a point which you can uh, appreciate by comparing Pierre Bourdieu with Karl Marx. So Karl Marx, you know, so economic capital is uh, uh, disembodied from ourselves. We don't carry it around in our heads. We carry it around in our bank statements, in our deposits, in our property. And it can be passed on, inherited, sold. That allows it to be accumulated without a top, le without a, a top limit. You know, it is easy to earn your, you, know, you can have a million pounds or two million pounds or three million pounds. Now Bourdieu famously talks about cultural capital also being accumulated um, in terms of, you know, you, you, you acquire cultural capital, but he emphasises that it depends upon being embodied. We have to know by being socialised, you know, what high culture is. We can't just treat it as something you can build up in a bank account. You cannot pass on your degree certificate to your kids. Okay? You can't say, here's my PhD, off you go, doctor, you know, um, doctor, my, my kid. Uh, so th that's a really crucial difference. It means that you cannot accumulate cultural capital in the same way as you can accumulate economic capital. And the same applies too for, for your social networks, your social capital, people you know. Yes, even in the days of Facebook and Twitter, we can have lots of followers, but we cannot really know vast. Now, as we get to know more people, we know them less well. And I think psychologists have argued once you get to 150 people, that's kind of the limit, that's the human limit to how many people you can really know as people. So, you know, the, the social capital over above that is, a, is thin social capital, it's weak social capital, if you like. And what this leads to, I think, is again the point that even though accumulation is multidimensional, and it works across cultural and social domains as well as the economic domain, the economic domain is really where the accumulation pulls ahead because you can pile up money in a way which you can't pile up cultural or social capital. What does this lead to? Um, it also leads to the idea that actually, um, to think about class, I think you need to think about classes in terms of the way people have certain kinds of um, accumulated advantages. Not just your situation in life at any one moment in time, but your trajectories, and your which you can link to your background, your parental background, your family background, but also your future prospects. And I'm very struck by a recent book 
by a German sociologist, Boyko Rabin, influenced by Bourdieu, who's tried to develop what he calls a new model of class, which looks at not your current job or your current economic position, but your trajectory through life. And he argues, through a comparative study of three countries, Laos, Germany and Brazil, that this kind of typology can be applied in all those four countries. At the very top, we've got small elites who are characterised by being born into a world where they simply do not have to think about their futures because their futures are guaranteed by the privileges of their parents and their families. This is a small group, though getting a bit bigger, um, but this is a kind of class apart in the Ray Raybine's thinking. Second group for um, Raybine is what he calls, or well, this is me, this is actually Ray Raybine and cross fertiliser of Piketty, is a group we call a patrimonial middle class. This is, this is a group who is not as well off as the elites, but they can expect to inherit significant resources during their life. So Piketty has this famous uh, figure that in the French case, around 15% of French people can expect to inherit three quarters of a million euros during their life. Now that's a lot of money. That's the average life earnings of a French person. So Piketty is making the point that a substantial proportion of French people can now expect, you know, yes, you may want a career, you may want to earn money, but actually you, you, you will get at some point in your life a substantial payout which is going to put you in a very privileged situation. And that sense of being a, a substantial inheritor will mark you out from people without those resources. And so the return of a kind of patrimonial middle class is, I think, a big driver of recent developments. Then the biggest group of all is a group which I think we could call the insecure middle working class. These are people who have to earn their living. Um, some of them get good income, some don't, but the Nonetheless, still characterised by insecurity in the labour market and the sense of you know, uncertainty and uh, instability. And finally, at the bottom, a group which we talked about in the, in the Great British Class Survey, which we called the precariat, who are characterised by having no assets or resources of any kind. So what this model shows is kind of the pulling apart of the class structure. Elites getting big, the precariat at the bottom, still a persistent group with very few resources, but you're also finding this patrimonial middle class who can expect to inherit substantial resources too. And I think this is quite a useful heuristic model for thinking about inequality in many parts of the world. OK, last part of my lecture, but in some ways the most important part of my lecture, the bit which I feel I really want to kind of um, draw out, um, is about the global patterns and understanding the global dimensions of inequality and how that impacts how that affects our understanding of class and uh, the challenge of inequality. And I really want to begin by showing a famous graph, which you, you, many of you may be familiar with. If you've read the book The Spirit Level, you've seen a graph like this. This is a graph produced by Canadian economist Miles Korak. And what he does is he looks at uh, a number of countries, and on the x-axis, he characterises them by their economic inequality. So the countries on the right-hand side are very unequal countries. Um, and then he looks at uh, the chances of social mobility in those countries. So on the y-axis, the, the vertical axis, is looking at how much uh, social mobility there is. And the, the, the higher that scale, actually the less mobility there is. The point here is a very simple one. The more unequal countries have the less social mobility. Which it, of course, isn't a huge surprise because the more unequal you are, the more difficult it is to get from top to bottom. But it's nonetheless a very arresting finding. Now, this kind of um, comparative national analysis is very widely used in studies of inequality and it's very important. It's given us, it gives us great ammunition to be concerned about inequality. But it has a substantial problem which is that these countries are hugely different in their size and geopolitical significance. And particularly if you look at the bottom left-hand corner, you see four small Scandinavian countries, um, Sweden, Finland, Norway and Denmark, who are relatively equal, and they also have higher social mobility, and they nearly always figure as the good countries. You know, you've got any measure, health, trust, 
participation in politics, these countries always score well. But there's four of them. Um, so they can kind of drag that line down. But then if you look at the top, you see China, which has got 1.3 billion people, you know, 20% of the world's population, being treated as equivalent to those four countries. And so my, my worry about this kind of way of thinking about inequality is we, we just compare nations as if they are equivalent analytical units and we don't do enough on understanding how nations vary in scale and significance. Uh, we need to try and not just do this kind of national comparative work. And that is where the work of the economist Branko Milanovic has been so important. And I just want to draw out what, why it matters and uh, how we can pull out these lessons for thinking about the challenge of inequality. So this is a very famous graph. Some of you may have seen it before. It's called the elephant graph for obvious reasons. It looks like an elephant. Um, and what he's done very cleverly is he has stitched together a global database of the, pretty much the entire world's population. So he's not just looking at different national <coughs> experiences. He's actually put together a global uh, database. And then he's, he's differentiated people according to how much, uh, sorry, their, their share of the global income distribution. So people on the right-hand side are the wealthiest people in the world. Uh, the people on the left-hand side are the poorest people in the world. And he compares how much the incomes of those groups changed between 1988 and 2008. And it shows you that the people on the right-hand side have done very well. This is the global elite, the most wealthy people. I've already emphasised top-end effects. So here's another, another top-end effect, very, very clear top-end effect. Um, they've done extremely well. But... What you can also see is it's this very large group in the middle. Um, around half the world's population have also seen their incomes rise substantially. This is the elephant's back. And there's a danger of forgetting that group, who actually form a very substantial proportion of the world's population, predominantly living in China and India, which is the two biggest countries in the world, some in Africa, some in South America. Uh, but then you can also find this quite a quite striking group here. Um, these are people who in global terms are pretty well off. Uh, they are, you know, in the top 20% of the world's income distribution. But these, ten, these are people who were in the kind of working class of the developed countries. European, American uh, earners who were amongst the poorest earners in their countries, but globally were still in the top 20%. But that's the group who uh, have done badly. And if you were to understand, you know, Donald Trump's appeal and some, some of the appeal to people voting Brexit in the UK, I think you can say, well, it's these people here who might well be looking at the people there who've done well and people behind them in the developing world who've done well and they have not done so well. So it's an obvious kind of, I think, argument here about the drivers of populist politics. So I think we've, got to, we've really got to understand these global dynamics if we think about class. And we've got to look at this emerging middle class in the developing world if we're to really understand how um, economic inequality is changing. And I, I, here I want to kind of make, a, uh, here's my attempt to make a kind of geopolitical argument um, about what is going on uh, in terms of the politics of inequality, not just within nations, but between nations. So, and I'm going to do this argument in, th in four steps. So bear with me. The first step is this. Where has inequality increased in the world? And you, here, here's a map of it. This is representing the Gini coefficient. Um, which is, we don't need to go into measuring the Gini, what the Gini coefficient means. It just is a very common metric used to measure inequality, income inequality. The areas in red have seen the biggest increase in the Gini coefficient between 1980 and 2013. Where are they? China, Russia, parts of Africa, India. Uh, that partly reflects the fact that the communist regimes in Russia and China were incredibly equal be be before 1980, but it also represents the fact that the economic growth in those part in Asia particularly has seen a massive increase of inequality in those countries. And that's important because you know, Asia is 60% of the world's population. So the Asian dynamics are really playing a key role in driving global income distribution. And I just want to show you two more graphs, well, 
as you can see, I like these colour graphs. Um, but they do tell a story. I want to try and talk you through it now, because I think it matters, it matters a lot to understand what is happening, I think, at the top end of the world income distribution. So this is another map which puts people according to their position in the, in the world income distribution. So the richest people are over here, and the poorest people on the left-hand side again. As you can see, it breaks down the top 1% into, into, into very small groups. Again, so we can look at top-end effects as we need to. Uh, this graph has been produced by the economists working with Thomas Piketty, very accurate using taxation data. Um, in 1990, if you look at the top 10% in the world, the people between here and here and not here, basically the world's richest people lived in, predominantly lived in North America and Europe. It's a very kind of simple, well, not, not it's not simple, but it's, it's not, none of a clear divide between the developed world and the developing world or the third world. Um, Chinese, Indian, Asian populations are on the left-hand side of that graph. Very clear global inequality patterns there. Um, if you look at that figure in 2016, um, you see quite a striking shift. Um, but the shift is complex. The blue of North America has not changed that much. Um, the North Americans, particularly the Americans, have held their share of the top 10% pretty well. They remain the global power in terms of top incomes. By contrast, the Europeans have substantially fallen back. If you compare the space in green, that one and that one, the greens have moved towards the middle. Uh, what has taken the place of the Europeans in this top distribution have been a much higher portion of Chinese, um, some other Asian, a bit of Indian, not much Indian yet, but some Indian. And we now, for the first time in several centuries, are in a situation where um, the majority of the world's uh, top 10% of earners are living in Asia. This is really quite a massive shift in global geopolitics. Of course, it's still disproportionate, given that 60% of the world's population live in Asia, it's still much more likely that you're going to be in the top few percent if you're from North America and Europe. But nonetheless, it's a very striking shift. Uh, and what I want to suggest is it explains one of the distinctive patterns about the rise of what I call here Anglo-Imperial inequality. One of the striking features about global inequality patterns is, is it's the Anglophone nations where inequality has really gone up strikingly. Um, so here I've got the kind of the, uh, a number of uh, nations which used to be part of the British Empire, um, if I can put it in those terms. Um, and you can see that uh, in every case, the lo this represents the top 10% of national income over time. So as you can see, that South Africa is the really outlying case. South Africa is probably the most unequal country in the world now. Um, and yes, you can see by 2014, uh, two thirds of the national income of South Africa went to the top 10%. But a similar pattern is found um, in most of these nations. And I think, why do you understand, what, what is going on here? I, I, so my, my, my um, interpretation is that this is a response to growing power of Asia, which is you're finding this kind of return of an a white um, expat Anglophone British imperial mission, which is leading uh, these nations to embrace, you know, free market, deregulated capitalism, which is quite happy with seeing uh, high level income inequality rise as a means of trying to keep geopolitical strength and dominance against the rise of Asian countries. And uh, I think you can look at Brexit in these terms. You know, Brexit is really, it seems to me, but Brexit is not really a nationalist thing. It's an imperial kind of notion of Britain reclaiming its position as a kind of imperial power. You see this very clearly in uh, people like Boris Johnson. Um, and it represents, you know, Britain as a kind of offshore imperial trading power in the way, well, Ireland, of course, is like that. Uh, and the US has elements of that too. So there's a, ki there's a kind of response, I think, to what's happening in, in Asia. Uh, thirdly, um, so I now want to talk about this kind of interesting um, European experience. This is Europe without the UK. Okay? 
Um, but there is a very interesting shift in what has happened with the, about income inequality within European nations, which is revealed by this chart. So again, this is the top 10% of national income in different parts of the world, produced by the group around Piketty. And if you look at the green line, the European line, there's an interesting, interesting thing, which is that in 1980, European countries were pretty unequal. Um, they were more unequal than uh, China, Russia, um, not very different from the USA. So high degrees of inequality in comparative terms within Europe. But although that green line increases a bit, uh, by 2016, Euro European nations are the, most sorry, are, the, are the least unequal in the world. Um, they become the kind of outliers in the global inequality stakes. By contrast, particularly look at India or China or USA, you find big increases of inequality. Some European nations have seen no increase in income inequality at all. Denmark, for instance. Um, most, of the, most of the Scandinavian countries are very limited, Netherlands. So somehow the European nations, leaving aside the UK, uh, <coughs> have not seen this big increase of inequality which has been found elsewhere. Um, but, and this is a point which Piketty really brings out, um, European nations have seen rising wealth inequality. This is kind of, I think, central to the European dynamic. European nations were the colonial uh, heartlands. They have a long history of old money, old wealth. And this is just a, a, a graph which compares the income and wealth distribution in France. And the point to make, if you look at the red line and the um, orange line, which look at the, inco the income shares in France, there's not much change. So in income inequality terms, France still has high, tax high taxation and hasn't seen a big shift of incomes to the top 1% or the top 10%, but it has seen a big increase in wealth inequality, as represented by the blue line and the um, green, li uh, green line. Yeah, the green line is the bottom 50% of wealth, and the, and, the, uh, and the blue line is the top 1% uh, of wealth. This is Piketty's point, that even in a country like France, which has been committed to not letting income inequality grow, wealth inequality can still increase year on year because of the force of accumulation. So, you know, the protests of the yellow vests have been very interesting, you know, because France is one of the more egalitarian countries in Europe, but clearly there are big economic inequalities which can be found there, and they can be understood by looking at issues of wealth inequality. And we're now seeing this really interesting research from many Scandinavian countries showing that even though Scandinavia has very high, sorry, very low levels of income inequality, wealth inequality can actually be very high. That is because these countries are the centres of uh, long-term wealth accumulation. And so Europe remains the centre of wealth accumulation because of its long-term historical uh, presence in kind of colonial, imperial regimes. And um, Gabriel Zuckman, uh, has written some very important work around the significance of offshore trading. He makes the point that it's Swiss banks which, lead, which led the way with offshore banking, offshore trading uh, from the first part of the 20th century. And even today, uh, Swiss banks remain key drivers of offshore tax havens. And what you can see really is that um, Switzerland, Britain and Ireland um, Luxembourg remain the dominant uh, uh, places, if you like, where offshore wealth has accumulated. So European forces are driving this agenda. So there's a kind of interesting um, contrast, if you like, between what is happening in Asia, rising income inequality, uh, the kind of the, the North American experience, which is kind of growing income inequality too, to kind of respond to the Asian challenge, if you like, and the, the European experience, which is much more based around global wealth inequality. And the final point I want to make is a bit more, bit more hopeful, I think, a bit of hope. Um, but it is to say that um, not all parts of the world have seen growing in income inequality. And indeed, when you go to parts of South America in particular, 
The experience of South America has been in the last 20 years that most nations have seen a decline in the inequality, albeit from a high base. Um, so here, if you look at South America, if it's in green here, which means that the, in the Gini coefficient has been declining in these years. Some African nations have also seen a decline in income inequality. What is going on here? So I think many of the South American nations have seen a kind of rebirth of national projects, which have been concerned to kind of rebuild a national fabric in the context of you know, moving away from authoritarian regimes, um, Pinochet regime in Ch Chile being a very good case of this, and they have been trying to rebuild national frameworks, national social contracts. When you can do this, then inequality can be contained because top earners, in a sense, have to recognise they need to work with a national settlement. Going back to the European case, uh, one of the things happening in many of the smaller European nations is, is the recognition that nations have to work as entities where different interest groups kind of work together. This is the kind of corporatist model, if you like. The, the nation has to be represented effectively through its um, through an agreement amongst different interests about working as a nation. One of my favourite articles about this is a comparison of uh, graduates in Oxford and Sciences Po in Paris. Made the point that elite graduates in Oxford, when they were asked about their future, would say they want to earn lots of money and have great careers. When you asked graduates at Sciences Po in Paris what, how they saw their future, they said, I want to, I want to help, I want to lead French society. The French graduates had a vision about being leaders of France. They had a vision about being having, having a role in a national mission, which uh, no, that's highly inegalitarian in some respects, but it was saying we don't just put our own interests first and let ourselves earn the highest amount of money. We do see ourselves as a national project. So, I mean, this is kind of, my own thinking has changed a lot. I used to be very strongly, you know, anti-nationalist, but in a way, in some contexts, national frameworks, where there's a commitment to sustainable a sustainable national project that has been the best structure for containing income inequality uh, increases. So many of these countries, particularly in South America, also some European nations where inequality has not grown very much, have been characterised, I think, by a persistence of a kind of national social contract. Um, so, um, I covered a lot of ground, um, probably a bit superficially, but um, uh, hopefully I've said some things which have interested you. Just to recap on some of them, we need to look not at occupations by themselves, not at employment by itself, but accumulation. And accumulation uh, is characterised partly by the more you have, the more you get. So it has these very profound top-end effects. Uh, we therefore need to think beyond kind of big class models where you, you bunch people in categories. You need instead to look at dynamics and forces of accumulation. That also leads us to think about wealth and inheritance and the passing on of privilege. And finally, I wanted to say that, you know, we can't just think about inequality in national terms anymore and assume that we're only interested in inequality within our own nation. We also need to be interested in the global pattern. And the global pattern is complex, because at one level, some parts of the world are catching up with richer areas, but we're also seeing quite big divergences in the way inequality is being expressed in different nations. That has some positive features in that I think some parts of the world where there are sustainable national projects have been able to contain forms of income inequality, but we're also seeing the kind of return of more imperial, kind of world-dominating projects, which are really encouraging high levels of inequality to, to be uh, developed in the midst of those projects. So we live in a very uncertain world and a very, and a very um, unstable world, but clearly it seems to me the issue of inequality is going to be at the centre of how we think about the, the future to come. Thank you.